Good morning, everyone. I'm Tom Carruthers, Vice President for Studies here at the Carnegie Endowment. My pleasure to serve as the moderator for this session. Let me first introduce Lincoln Mitchell. Lincoln is a longtime practitioner in the field of democracy assistance, having worked in many countries on programs. He was associated with the National Democratic Institute for a time, but has worked for many organizations as a consultant and has a great deal of practical experience. And he's also a writer, thinker, scholar, had an association with Columbia University for a time. He maintains an active writing profile, both on domestic politics, but also on democracy assistance. Um, he's the author of, this is his third book, uh, he had a book in 2008 on Georgia and U.S. foreign policy related to Georgia's Rose Revolution. In 2012, he published a book on the, Rose, uh, the color revolutions. And now in 2016, this book, I've noticed Lincoln every four years, and it happens to be an election year, but I'm sure that's a coincidence. Um, and this is a big book. This is a book that spans uh, really the whole field of U.S. democracy promotion, which is a big field, as we know. It's complicated institutionally. It's complicated in terms of its practical effects on the ground. And this book attempts to take on a lot of the very big questions in this field. And I think it comes at a good time. This is, is an election year. I'm sure the campaign is moving soon to a sort of technocratic process of careful consideration of policy issues. And we'll um, move away from the current style, as it always does, as we get closer to election day. Um, but it's also a time in which I would say the policy community here in the United States, but also I know in Europe and other democratic countries, is really thinking very hard about the state of democracy in their own countries, the state of democracy in the world, and the place of democracy assistance, support, promotion uh, in their foreign policies, given a fair amount of bad news in recent years, which has called into question some people's assumptions about how this field works, and what effects it has. And so there, there is a process of serious reflection, I think, going on within this field. And I know this book will be a significant contribution to that. The book is called The Democracy Promotion Paradox. But paradox there is in singular. But once you start reading the book, you're awash in paradoxes. Um, and the book starts with a broad overview of the contemporary history of US democracy promotion. And you, you highlight, Lincoln, a whole series of paradoxes. Let me just mention a couple of them. The fact that US democracy promotion is viewed very differently from inside the country than from outside, that it seeks to change the nature of governance in very profound ways in countries, but often relies on non democratic governments as partners, that it is often outweighed by other US policy interests, that it often involves a strong role for the US military, that it is sometimes integral to US policy, yet sometimes apart from it, and many more. It's a very rich portrait of the many complexities of democracy promotion. And you come to a point uh, in which you uh, sort of summarize the quandary that you feel these paradoxes leave democracy promotion in. And I'll say this leads to a serious and persistent quandary in democracy promotion. The United States can either revamp and strengthen its programs and approach or recognize that this work in its current form is unlikely to have a big impact. Neither of these options are good ones for policymakers. The former option, revamping, would create serious tensions with friendly non-democratic governments that accept democracy promotion work in their countries precisely because it is unlikely to have an impact. The latter would call into question the whole purpose and project of democracy promotion, reduce, reducing it to a set of benign, feel-good programs with little or no impact. So that's the quandary. Now, what I'd like to do in this first part of our discussion, uh, actually, the organizers asked me to mention that the food came a little bit late. And so uh, we're going to just proceed over the noise of the rumbling stomachs and uh, go till about 12.50 and finish then. In the first half of this hour ahead of us, I'll be having a conversation with Lincoln, and then I'll turn it over to you to ask the author questions you have in your mind. And what I really want to do in the next 20 to 25 minutes is try to give Lincoln a chance to set out some of the main lines of his thinking. So what I'd like to do is talk about four or five of the major paradoxes that you present and just hear your thoughts a bit on them. And I'll sort of come back to you with questions or comments. And at a few points, I'm going to read a couple of other quotes uh, in the book. Although I think I'm going to skip the one where you quote one of my writings in, in a negative light. Um, but I'll, um, actually, maybe we'll come to that. We'll see. Uh, see how the conversation goes. <clears throat> you know, I was reading the book, and I was thinking about this is a lunch event. And I was thinking of the, the 
I hope you enjoyed the lunch because I was thinking of the old Hollywood adage of you know the person who writes the tell-all book and never has lunch in this town again. I thought we could call this Lincoln's Lincoln's last lunch in Washington. Um, but but seriously, as you as you mentioned, this book is not a broadside attack on the field of democracy promotion. But you ask a lot of hard questions and you make a lot of very telling points, which do need to be taken seriously by people and could be interpreted by people as a, a fairly you know. Not harsh, but a fairly penetrating criticism of some basic aspects of this work. So let's bring that out as well. So <clears throat> you mentioned three paradoxes of implementation. I'd like to talk about each of them. They include the fact that the United States puts forward only relatively modest programs, yet encases them in extremely ambitious goals. The second one is that the US tries to produce significant political changes in some non-democratic countries yet finds itself working with those non-democratic governments as their partners in that process. Third, that the United States uses US NGOs to implement programs overseas, yet these NGOs are often almost fully funded by the US government. <clears throat> so let's take each of these in turn, then we'll turn to a few others. Let's start with the modest programs, ambitious goals. Tell me a bit more about your view of that and the consequences of that. Well, first of all, thank you, Tom, for the introduction and for the discussion. For the careful read of the book, um, the first person who read this book, as with all my books, was my mother, who said to me, how do you know all this stuff? <laughs> <laughs> and thank you for the Center for Global Interest uh, for putting this event together and for Carnegie for hosting this. Um, this question of ambitious goals, modest, modest uh, activities, and modest processes, to me, is at, is at the center of, of the, one of the democracy motion paradoxes. The, the goal of changing a country from a non-democratic regime to a democratic regime is almost always an enormous goal. That should be pretty much axiomatic. There are exceptions to that. There are moments when a country is moving towards democracy and needs a nudge in the right direction or needs a little bit of incentivizing or needs some technical support. Uh, the most kind of often cited examples of those are countries uh, like, for example, Poland in the early 1990s and other parts of other countries in that part of the world. Now, my, my argument is that that experience informs and has informed too much or a lot of how, how we think or how, how we do democracy promotion policy. So in those cases, yes, that approach for the most part worked. However, when you look at other countries, and we can think of countries throughout you know, the, the former Soviet region, because I know that's, a, that's the CGI's focus, it's very different, right? So the modest, the, the, the small activity in the context of a large democratic country of we're going to help parliament function more professionally, we're going to build the capacity of civil, civil society organizations, these are, these are not tiny things, but they are modest in the context of, of the goal. It is, it is clear that in some senses, in almost all cases, a better, I mean, why not have a better functioning parliament? There's no real downside to that. But, but the leap of kind of faith that says from there you're going to get democracy to me isn't convincing. I'm reminded of the, uh, and we see this frankly in a lot of the USA, in a lot of the, uh, the democracy promotion work because I, when I do evaluations, I'm frequently told the goal of this evaluation is to see whether the program was implemented well rather than to see what effect it had, which to me is a recognition that it's, you know, we knew it wasn't going to have that big of an effect. I'm reminded of, um, I don't know, I think I left this out of the book, but I'm reminded of the old Far Side cartoon. I don't know if anyone knows this, but there's a uh, scientist in a lab coat with a very complicated mathematical equation, you know, on one side of the board, and on the other side of the board, an equally complicated mathematical equation, and in the middle it says the word, then a miracle occurs. Um, and sometimes it, it feels that way. These are all good, these are all good modest standalone programs. The, the logic that they're going to have that big of an impact, especially when you get to very large countries, is, 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 a, is a question. And are you, I mean, I don't want to get ahead of ourselves, but are you implying from that either that sort of <clears throat> fisher cut bait in the sense of either scale back these ambitious goals, don't encase these programs in such sort of grand ambitions, or are you saying, you know, take these goals seriously and, and concentrate, step up your efforts and, and have, you know, means that match your goals. Well, I don't want to get too far ahead, except to say I really stayed away from policy prescriptions. I don't have the answer. And, and I want to be, be clear about that, because one of the reasons I don't have the answer is I, I not only have I written about the democracy promotion paradox, but I experienced it, right? I mean, I, the mission of, of trying to make other countries more democratic, of 
trying to help people live more freely and, and have some you know, input over who they're govern who's governing them and what laws there are is a valuable one. And the evidence suggests that the US can play, doesn't always, but can play a role in that. So I don't want to really prescribe which, which way to go on that. What I want to say is to look more soberly at what, at what the situation is and to craft policies that reflect that, reflect the situation as it is, not as we would like it to be, or as it once was. All right, well then let's move on to the next paradox that you mentioned about the US is in the position in some cases of trying to produce democratic change, but working with a non-democratic government as a partner. Tell me more about that. Well, and, and this, isn't, this is the case in most, but not all countries, right? So we can think of some countries, uh, Cuba and Belarus, where obviously it's a little more difficult to do democracy promotion programs, but where our programs there we're not doing in partnership with uh, the governments of those, of those countries, right? So we can think of some exceptions to that. But in many countries, we have a complicated relationship with the government. The government is not democratic. We would like to see the government have a better human rights record. We would like to see the government have a better democracy record, a more liberal approach. On the other hand, the government is essentially an ally, right? They are, they are an ally because they have resources that we like, because we have a trade relationship, because they are on our, they support us in various, you know, broader geopolitical questions. And to do democracy promotion in a country like that without working at least a little bit with the government would create enormous problems in that bilateral relationship. And again, I'm not really prescribing that we say, you know, the democracy is more important than the bilateral relationship, so we should sever this relationship in those countries, nor am I necessarily saying, well, look, if you're going to be friends with that country, don't even try to make democracy better. Just give up. But I am saying we have to recognize the difficulty there. And I, I can think of an example where um, I was evaluating a program in Armenia, which was a legislative support program, which is not, uh, you know, for those of you who aren't in the business, this is not a very unusual program. The idea is that a, a a US AID partner, actually a contractor, will provide technical and other support to the legislature to help it function better, which is, you know, I think that's a good program. And, you know, the people doing it are smart people, Armenians, local, uh, you know, in this case, Americans who are working together to make this happen. The, when we started to do the program, do the evaluation, we had a very tough time getting interviews with members of parliament. You can see how evaluating this program without access to the parliament could be a problem, right? I mean, just uh, from, a, from a work angle. And it became clear that the reason for this was that the Speaker of Parliament simply didn't want us to meet with anybody. And the Speaker of Parliament ran the program, ran the Parliament with you know, more or less of an iron fist. And, and to continue to work with that kind of a speaker in an effort to, to democratize just the institution of Parliament itself was not going to work. Mm -hmm. But you can't, if you, but, but we can't say we're gonna have a parliamentary program that ignores the structures of Parliament. This is just one institution within government. And that is, that, is the ongoing, that is the ongoing problem. These, these programs are smart governments. And, and it doesn't include all governments, but smart governments understand that when you, know, you are, have a bilateral relationship with the United States, they are concerned that your level of democracy is not what, they would, what, what the United States would like, that they are concerned about, say, your human rights record, that, but they're giving you, say, military help on some things, and you're working on some projects together. If, if they want to spend 8, 10, 12, 15 million dollars, if the US wants to spend it on democracy, mm -hmm. the smart thing to do is not to scream about intervention and to scream about this is wrong, but to say, okay, let's work together on this. Because there's no way the United States can say no to that, except for in some extreme cases. But by working together on this, you can make sure, if you're smart, that it has a limited impact. You can influence things like just to be concrete. For example, we see this in many countries where there is a program where a US donor, has a program to give mini grants to various civil society organizations working on a whole range of potential issues. Well, if you are working in partnership with USAID as the government, you can have some, not complete, but some influence over what the, who those civil society organizations are. Well, that's, that has a huge influence on the program, for example. But, I mean, a couple of things struck me when I was reading this section of the book. I mean, first that you use the term non-democratic government, but wouldn't it be the case if you took the list of governments with which, say, USAID works on its democracy and, and the State Department, its uh, democracy assistance programs, only a relatively small percentage of those would be non-democratic in the Freedom House, since many are countries like the Philippines or Malawi or Peru, which have 
you know, some democratic characteristics, but are not authoritarian. They're, they're you know, troubled democracies or democracies with many shortcomings. By using the term non-democratic, you seem to be painting with a fairly broad brush. Yeah, and I, I struggled with this in the book because I spent some time on kind of talking about different kinds of regimes. But I wanted to, I wanted to, I wanted to not exactly paint with a broad brush, but make some statements that, that I think were more broadly true. Mm -hmm. And, and even, even in cases like that, it is, it is those, those countries that are hybrids, right? They have elements that are democratic, but also elements that are not democratic, and, and, and also elements within the political structures that really don't want it to be democratic. And, and I do argue that most of the remaining non-democratic countries, to the extent they're non-democratic, are, are non-democratic because the leadership doesn't want it to be democratic, as opposed to they just haven't figured it out yet. And the latter, underlies the latter, if the latter were true, then of course we'd work with all these governments. If the former were true, it's a little more problematic. You also didn't mention the fact, at least in some of them, I'm thinking, for example, of Zimbabwe or Belarus, the US is engaged in democracy assistance, but really greatly emphasizes the non-governmental side, even through some cases USAID, sometimes cases through the National Endowment for Democracy or the State Department or others. And you didn't mention the possibility of is it worth, you know, worthwhile uh, trying to support civil society in these very difficult environments as, a, as an approach to official U.S. democracy. Well, well, I did talk about Belarus a little bit, although not in that way, but as an example of a country where we really don't work with the government. And in that sense, I mean, one can argue whether that's effective or not. I mean, we have to, you know, that's a different discussion. But there is a, there is a consistency to that. If the government is non-democratic, mm -hmm. and to work with institutions, you know, if I work with, say, the prime minister's office of a non-democratic government, or even political parties, including a, mm -hmm. a ruling party that is in the business of making sure it remains not democratic, that's different, right? If you, yeah. As opposed to, I think there is a certain, you don't, you don't have mm -hmm. this paradox in those cases. But those cases are, are, are not a lot of them. They're the exceptions mm -hmm. rather than the rule. Okay. You do have, you go into an interesting discussion of the relationship of governance work to democracy work, and you talk about to some extent what you think is a confusion on the part of some, and I just came this morning from large meetings at the World Bank on Global Partnership for Social Accountability, where, you know, the bank is, you know, headlong into governance work over the last 10 or 20 years, yet not into democracy work, and, and this question of the relationship between doing governance work and doing democracy work continues to be a puzzle and in some cases a source of confusion. Do you think that's part of what's at the root of what you're highlighting when you talk about a case like Armenia? You have a fairly juicy quote about a program in, I think it's Turkmenistan, yeah, where they're teaching people to use Skype. Nice quote, but um, is, that, is that what you're? That's part of it, yes. Yeah. And you know, the, the example I give to my students, which is a little extreme, but is what does a governance program in North Korea look like? Are you helping them starve their citizens faster, right? Now that's a little bit of, of a wise apple comment, but it is, it's, it's an, there's, a, there's reason for that, right? Which is that governments and democracy, there are moments when it overlaps in very important ways. And we talk about this in the book too, where kind of newly democratic, democ democratic countries, countries that have had a democratic breakthrough, working to improve governance so that the democracy can deliver, to use the kind of language that we hear, is an example of when that is important. Parenthetically, if you were um, doing a DRG assessment of the United States, one of the one of the issues you would raise is that democracy isn't delivering, which is one of the things that's giving rise to these non-democratic movements in the United States. But too frequently, um, democracy and governance are too conflated. And it is assumed that governance, better governance leads to better uh, democracy. And that is not always true. In fact, if you are a non-democratic government, mm -hmm. you know, um, one of the best ways to avoid kind of an Arab Spring scenario is to govern better is to be more effective, is to deliver the services better, is to create a sustained economic growth. Um, and, you know, there are, there are concrete U.S. interests, U, reasons why that is in the U.S. interest to, to see those governments govern better. But as a democracy strategy, it is frequently something very different. It, it also definitionally, you know, democracy is, is a structure of, of how to arrange a government. It's an ideology. It's a lot of things. Those of us who believe in democracy, um, you know, believe that it's the, I mean, at least I speak for myself, and I assume others who are, think of themselves as advocates for democracy, mm -hmm. would say it is, it is the best at delivering. It is the best at governance, right? It's not just, they're not, they're not unrelated, but, but they're not, but, but good governance, there, there are many ways to get to good governance as, as well. And, and, and if we definitionally, if we conflate them definitionally, mm -hmm. 
then we get to policies that make it much easier to focus on governance, because governance programs are easier. It's the technical side. Right? One of the paradoxes that you didn't mention that I talk about in the book is, is um, and I apologize to my former students because you've heard me say this over and over, is technical solutions to political problems. Right? Governance pro programs tend to work better because they're technical solutions to technical problems. We'll come, or maybe in the questions people want to follow, but let's move on to a different topic. The, the question of using US NGOs, which are in some cases largely funded by the US government or have significant funding from the US government. Let me read a quote uh, on that um, from the book. Um, you say, uh, American NGOs would be more accurately characterized as SGOs or semi-governmental organizations. A less charitable term might be PGOs for pseudo-governmental organizations. The nomenclature, the nomenclature is not as important as the extent to which democracy promotion can or cannot be separated out, not just from US policy, but from US government programs and bureaucracy. Presenting democracy work as distinct from the US government is somewhat disingenuous, but it also reflects a failure on the part of the United States to understand that most of the rest of the world views these NGOs as simply a part of the US government. Thus, democracy work itself is seen as being to a substantial extent in the service of the US government and of US interests. Tell us more about that. I will. Um, this is the only city in the world where I would have to answer that question. <laughs> so, and, and, and I really mean that. To, to, um, and, and it is, and I recognize also that's, a, that's an American perspective. And this book is largely about the United States, not about European perspectives. But um, if your salary is, the United States government can get sources, can get money from two places, right? Taxpayers and borrowing it from China. And, and if your salary and the rent for your office comes from a combination of those two places, even if you are part of an organization that, for example, has an autonomous board, even if you are part of an organization that has an autonomous board and that pushes back and challenges the United States government, as these organizations do, with, and, and honorably and, and, and rightfully, that you are a, a non-governmental organization is a conceit that, that is not believed outside of that, that organization. And to me, that is on the one hand problematic because there is a disconnect between what the people who work for that organization and the people in the field believe, right? And anyone who has worked for a non-governmental organization in the field and had a real disagreement with the US ambassador knows that at some point you're going to lose that disagreement. Because you are not because if you were a non-governmental organization without, I mean, ultimately the ambassador could say something, but if your money were really coming from somewhere else, it would be different, right? So that is that is that is one piece of it. Um but but so, so, so it kind of feeds this different, this different view and makes it harder um, for that. But it also, you know, it's also, a la you know, the U.S. And, and I think that, that, that internally in the United States, it really does seem like these are standalone organizations. When you are working for, for example, NDI as I did, you don't feel like you are working for the U.S. government. That is a mischaracterization of how you feel. And, that, and oftentimes, the work that you're doing, you are doing the democracy work. And the US government presence may really be either totally de-emphasizing democracy, or not focusing on it, or not talking about it. But if you are on the other side of that, right, you see, I mean, in other words, if you're living in that country, you view all of these organizations as working for the United States government, as it being on the same page, even when they're not. And that's where, that's where I see uh, the complication. I don't mean it. I don't mean it disrespectfully. I also know that there are many NGOs, domestic organizations in the United States that are NGOs that receive government funds, right? So for example, after school programs for, uh, for urban kids, you know, often run through, through community organizations that are reliant upon, upon um, you know, public city states funds from the city. But that is obviously a much less political type of organization. That's just, it's not at the same level. Maybe people in the audience will want to come back onto this, but you, you said something in the beginning, you mentioned only in Washington would you have to, in a way, say this. You've been doing some book events in other cities, particularly in New York. You spoke at the 92nd Street Y and elsewhere in New York. Tell me something about the difference when you have an audience there and you have an audience here. What are the, how are the assumptions so different? Well, broadly or with regard to this question? No, broadly. Broadly, the, the difference is, and I get at this at some point in the book, that most other places in America, 
it, the starting point is that democracy promotion is a waste of money and ineffective. Or, or when I go to San Francisco next month, and imperialist. Um, <laughs> and I say that as the most loyal San Franciscan, you know. I was rooting for the San Francisco Giants back when you people in Washington barely knew we had a team. So I, you know, I mean that was very respectfully. But that is really true. And that is one of, I think, the paradoxes that there is a real disconnect domestically. And one of my, there's a whole chapter in the book about the domestic American side of this. But there is a real paradox, a real disconnect between what the kind of bipartisan foreign policy establishment, and I don't mean that in, in, a, in a pejorative sense, thinks about democracy promotion and what ordinary Americans, left, right, and, and center do. I mean, I, you know, and, and I, start, I, I, for those of you who, uh, haven't bought the book yet, and I can't imagine too many of you who haven't bought the book. That'll be remedied oh. within a half an hour after the Okay, finish, yeah. but, yeah. but you know, on page one, I talk about my experience. I, I, Tom said it's my last lunch in Washington, but, you know, um, I, I'm a San Franciscan and a New Yorker, so, so I'm, I'm coming at this from the outside. I can always eat out in, in those towns. But um, <laughs> when, I, when I lived in, when I live in, I live in New York, and I talk about the reactions people would have to me when I told them what I was doing. Right? And I, one, I, one that I didn't talk about is I was working as a consultant right. on democracy programs. Is, and one story I didn't tell, but I will tell this, is around 2006 or 7, I, um, I was at a birthday party for my son, the friend of one of my, my son's friend, birthday party. And I was just back from, I think, Kiev or somewhere. You know, I was a little exhausted, jet lagged. And um, I was talking to this other father there who I didn't know. Um, and I told him, I was, I was kind of spacing out, and I said, I'm sorry, I'm a little jet lagged. And he said, I'm a little jet lagged today, too, by the way, in case you haven't noticed. I flew in from, from Georgia yesterday. So, so he said, why? And I said, well, I just came back from Kiev. And he said, what were you doing there? And I started explaining to him. I couldn't get away from him the rest of the party. And he was so angry at me for doing this. And you know, whereas he's kind of a pompous guy, that, I mean, he is, believe me, that tone is not unusual. Right when I walk my and I, and I live on the Upper West Side of Manhattan. I mean, the, you know, I live in a community where a lot of people are educated, graduate degrees, all of that kind of thing, and they will ask me, "Why are we helping these people? Why do we care if Egypt is a democracy or not?" Well, and I will try to answer that question in a kind of policy sense of why it might be in Americans' interest and why maybe, as as human from human rights angle, this would be better for everyone involved. And they simply don't want to hear it. And these are not and these are people who might be kind of center left, right? These are people who are happily going to vote for Hillary Clinton. And do you uh, think that's a change from five years ago, 10 years ago? Well, to go back, 15 years ago, people just simply didn't know about it, right? There was a kind of a bipartisan consensus in Washington, and the rest of the country didn't think about it. Then, you know, the, and I think this is for worse, and inaccurately, but democracy promotion was brought to most people's consciousness through the Bush administration, which was, which was it's kind of quaint to talk about George Bush now as a polarizing figure, but he was a polarizing president. And many Democrats, and many on the left, simply lumped in democracy promotion with the other excesses, Abu Ghraib and the Iraq War, and, and the kind of the neocon, the freedom agenda, lumped all that together, which was not, in my view, fair. Mm -hmm. But it is, it is real. It is what happened. And, and additionally, a, a right-wing critique emerged as well, right? This is a waste of money, a, a, I think, an implicitly racist critique some people had, and I'm not putting an ideological label on this, of, you know, these, we've heard this in the, in the world of democracy for a century or more. These people aren't ready for a democracy because you know, they're Muslim or something like that. But that, that view is out there as well. Here in Washington, a very, very different sense on these things. Although this campaign may be different. In the past, as we were talking before, presidential campaigns or the way it worked out and the choice of candidates tended to ended up converging in each party. There's a division in each party about this topic. And within each party, a resolution towards a candidate who represented what you call the mainstream consensus. This year, we looks like we'll have a contest between one who doesn't represent this mainstream foreign policy consensus and one who does. And that has implications for any discussions about democracy support. Yes, and we will we will see because you know uh, Hillary Clinton, who obviously is a candidate who represents the establishment view on on most foreign policy issues. I mean, and, and there's a range of views within that establishment view, but she's comfortably within that range. Um, you know, she defeated a prime. And am I, we can say this in the past tense. We're living in reality here. She defeated a primary opponent who had a very different view. You know, Bernie Sanders' democracy promotion policy, had he and Donald Trump sat, you know, they, they'd be much closer than, than what we see now. The extent to which this is an issue that will move voters to the Republican candidate, that seems like a question for which I don't have an answer. And, and um, 
I don't know how far afield we want to get, but yes, yeah. this is a, this is, okay. and what this means for the future of American political parties, that's also a very, you know, as it folds into larger foreign policy questions about the U.S. role in the world. Let's come to your major conclusions. You you work toward um, a kind of uh, you know general statement uh, about uh, where you think this field is. You present four options, not just three, like most policy books, but four. Um, and those four are, uh, if I remember them correctly, just looking through, um, continuing to stumble through, reducing or eliminating democracy promotion, becoming more confrontational, or a more strategic approach. Now, if this were an SAT test, students would be advised <laughs> to choose the fourth um, because it's, it's presented in a way which sounds like the acceptable choice. Um, and let me just read how you present this question of what a more strategic approach would be. <clears throat> the last potential shift in democracy promotion would be to continue to do democracy work, but to approach it more strategically. Rather than applying the same battery of democracy promotions in more or less whatever democratic country will allow it, a more strategic approach would entail targeting fewer countries, putting more resources into those countries, and making an effort to craft programs that address the specific needs and political environment in each. This may mean moving away from a methodology that rests heavily on technical support and capacity building. This reform is intuitively appealing as becoming more strategic always sounds like a wise decision in any endeavor. This, is this what you're recommending? To, well, in, in would, I'm curious in the questions, I can see a few people who I think might raise a hand and say, you've described what we're trying to do, but I'm not sure well, if that's true or not. But. Um, firstly, I, I really don't recommend, mm -hmm. I really wanted to lay out scenarios rather than to make recommendations because for, for exactly that reason. I mean, that, that last one, and I, I, I want it to be taken seriously, mm -hmm. but it is essentially saying be smarter and more strategic, and no one's going to say no. What we need to do is be dumber and less strategic, right? So it's, it's a kind of a false argument. You know, there's no, there's no counter argument to that. But the rest of that section, I talk about how this all sounds so much easier than it actually is, mm -hmm. right? How do you determine what countries are poised for democratic breakthrough? That's a very, very difficult question. I mean, you know, that, that, that we can spend years studying and writing books and getting tenure and still don't answer those, those questions. So, so that alone, right, what are, what are these more strategic programs going to look like? Mm -hmm. So, um, and, and in reality, I think, this and stumbling along are much closer than it seems, than, than they might at first seem, because stumbling along is not saying, oh, heck, let's just do nothing. It's like, let's keep trying to get slightly better, and that may be what, what we can do. So of course I would say, let's do this smarter and more effectively. But I want to really stress that doing it smarter and more effectively is much, much, there are a lot of good people, smart people that spend a lot of time trying to figure out exactly how to do that. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's very difficult. There's plenty of ways to go wrong uh, with that approach. And when you talk about reducing the number of countries and being more selective with the criteria one might use the, Larry Diamond has talked about this uh, in some of his arguments about strategic approaches. One approach might be use the term country poised for a democratic breakthrough that one looks for countries which are not at such a breakthrough but might be and therefore invested that. One could be more selective by choosing countries which actually seem to be making good use of democracy assistance and are already kind of moving forward and the assistance is clearly facilitating something that's good. Or thirdly, one could try to choose some really hard cases where kind of if we don't do it, you know, the lamps of, of freedom go off permanently and let's keep some hope alive. One could be selective in that way given the limited resources. What, when you mean be more selective, which of those three or other and, options? And, and a fourth option should be focus on countries where, where for whatever reason it is very important for United States right. foreign policy. That's right. So that would be a fourth one. I mean, I think from a technical angle, and this is the direction I go, I talk about what I speak about in the book or write about in the book is to look at countries that are poised for a democratic breakthrough. But then I go and say, how would we know that? Mm -hmm. And and that's that's the answer is we haven't been very good at knowing that. Not because we're not smart, but because these are really, really difficult questions to answer. So so again, that's you know, if we want to look at countries where where democracy promotion 
they seem to know how to use the, the there you're going to be looking at countries that are either pretty far along anyway, right, where you're essentially pushing an open door, mm -hmm. or countries that are very good at faking it. Mm -hmm. And that's, and the latter is certainly not a great option. The former is probably not going to hurt, but may not be the top priority. Okay. I do have a few more questions, but I want to give the audience a chance to come in now, and I'll wait and pose one or two more questions along the way. Uh, I know people, most people haven't had a chance to read the book yet, but you've heard some of Lincoln's thinking, and he's always kind of ready for anything. I know the guy. Um, and he enjoys a good discussion. So uh, please state your name and your organization you're with, and it's a lot of hands. So also be patient. I'm going to start right here in the middle with you two. I'll come here and come over here. This gentleman and then the woman right behind him. Yeah, there's a microphone coming on your left. to be there in a second. Rich Koslerich from George Mason University and former U.S. ambassador in Bosnia and Herzegovina and Azerbaijan. Um, you know, what you describe is kind of what I had to work with as ambassador. And I will say today that the toolkit is broken. The real challenge is what do you, what do you, how do you work with democracy trying to use the same old tools when developing local NGOs ends up with the leaders of those NGOs getting thrown in jail or worse, where the government has expropriated the concepts of democracy to turn to their own purposes, and we've not found a way yet to, to overcome, overcome that part. Um, so I understand you don't, you're, you're not making recommendations, but somebody's going to have to come up with a new approach because just throwing more money at it using these traditional models uh, will not will not work. So, what do you tell the the ambassador of today in in Bosnia or or Azerbaijan what they should do to, to try to promote democracy? Because it's not going to go away. I think is is an issue. Take that question and the next one, the woman right there behind you, if you could, and then think that over and then come back on both questions, please. Um, I'm Sarah Wall, and I actually work at National Democratic Institute. Um, I guess my question kind of fits right hand in hand with this gentleman's. Um, what was kind of your purpose and rationale for staying away from making policy recommendations? Like you indicated a few times that that was something you were very intentional about. And I'm just curious, like what led you to that decision? Answer those two? Yeah, please. So let me start with the second one. Um, I, my, my purpose and rationale for that is I read too many reports that end with recommendations that are platitudes and with very difficult questions. Like I said, I really don't have the answer to these questions. What I would have done is written five pages of platitudes at the end of the book. And, and I feel like, I, I, I don't, let me rephrase that, that would have gone contrary to the gestalt of the rest of the book and I didn't want to do that. So I laid out scenarios instead. Um, with regards to the ambassador's question, there's another piece I would add to what you said, and, and I think I mentioned this in the book. I know I wrote, I wrote a whole article about this somewhere else years ago, which is that there is a cost to not doing democracy promotion, right? I think I said this in the sense of, in the scenario of stopping doing it, right? If we simply stop, we are abandoning these, these allies in these countries who are really doing good work and for whom a grant from the NED, a project with USAID is a lifeblood, and that lifeblood is contributing something because it, it allows ordinary citizens in that country to, to read reports that show maybe the problems of corruption or that read reports that or to mechanisms that help try to keep the government uh, the government more accountable to the people. So the toolkit to a great extent is broken, but it's further complicated that and also it sends a message, right? If we stop supporting these these groups, the politics of that are not great for the United States because it says kind of like, oh, we give up. And we really don't want to do that either. So these, to me, to me, that's a very serious question. I don't have the, the answer, except I will say, I, I know part of, I know half the answer. And half the answer is to recognize these paradoxes. Because when you recognize these paradoxes, you stop platitudining, I'm sorry uh, for sounding like George Bush, you stop platitudining your way out of the problem. You have to wrestle with, the real paradoxes and the real challenges once you recognize them. And that makes it much more likely, but much more difficult to get to a real solution. But you do have, you know, one of your four scenarios is be more confrontational. Uh, what about that? Well, I, I mean, it's not, it's not something, again, I'm not making recommendations, but if there, the, the, the advantage of being confronta more confrontational is that you, you get rid of a lot of these paradoxes, right? If you say we're not going to approach 
technical problem, polit political problems with technical solutions, we're going to use political problems. If you say we're going to recognize that these non-government, pick a country that, that you've worked, we're really going to recognize just how non-democratic Azerbaijan is, not 2016, but going back five years or more. You know, it, you, you get rid of a lot of these paradoxes, and that makes it a cleaner approach. The extent to which you're th you are therefore more effective, I'm not convinced of that. But it certainly is a scenario where you could see American foreign policy going under the right circumstances. I'm going to come here, then I'll come to this other side, then get to the back. Yes, this, this woman here, please. I'm Olivia De La Pena. I'm a student at George Mason University. And one thing I'm actually really curious about is what do you have, um, what do you do when you're in an instance like with um, U.S. policy towards Colombia? So during Alvaro Uribe's administration, you had the U.S. military spend a lot of time, money, and training in trying to defeat the FARC because the FARC was seen as an enemy against democracy and against the naturally more conservative leaning. And now all of a sudden you have Juan Manuel Santos who's saying, let's make peace with the FARC, where you have Uribe retaliating and saying, this is destroying democracy, this is destroying freedom, and this is assimilating these communist guerrillas into the Colombian government. So at that point, what would be the best solution for the U.S.? Should the U.S., in a sense, like be pushing for this whole idea of a peace movement? Because on the one hand, we want to be promoters of peace, but on the other hand, we're, in a sense, undoing all the democratic work that we had been doing in Colombia before and letting this go through. And there was another hand here down in front before, yeah, right next to you, yeah, sir. Yeah, hello, I'm um, Yuri Perez. I'm a freedom fighter from, from Cuba, now working in the House. Um, I noticed uh, working in both sides and with the democracy promotion as a program in Cuba and now uh, supporting people on the ground, that sometimes, like the, the funders, I'm talking about USA, Net, they uh, don't identify the, the problems on the ground that well, and then they push money for the stuff that maybe the people on the ground don't want to do or they are not interested to do. I guess you talk about that topic in, in your book, and I, I would like to hear you. Thank you. Um, we're doing two at a time? Please. OK, yeah. so um, I speak decent Chinese, a little bit of Russian. I can say a few profanities in Georgian. And I speak uh, my grandparents' Yiddish. Um, I, I've, I've, grown, I've lived in Spanish-speaking neighborhoods almost my whole life and don't speak Spanish. And as a result of that, I've done less work in Latin America than any other region, because it's the one region where there's just enough Spanish speakers you don't have. So I'm not expert on, on, on this issue in Colombia. I don't want to pretend that I am. However, I, I will say in general terms, yeah, in general terms, determining, answering these kinds of questions are important. And it's also important to think about the extent to which they are about democracy, right? Because there is one example that is a foreign policy question. And one example, and one approach, one way to look at it as a foreign policy question, which side do you want to be on? What is the politics of that? And one is a democracy question. What is the most democratic thing? And to recognize that is not always the same. If I can move to a region with which I'm a little more familiar to make uh, what you won't think of as a good analogy, but bear with me, because it's the best I can do. Um, in 2006, there were elections in the Palestinian Authority, as, as many people uh, remember. And um, the winner of that election was Hamas. And I was uh, a little bit involved with that and, and paid a lot of attention to that. Um, and there was some criticism uh, that there were some people who advocated that Hamas, because they are a terrorist organization, because they have advocated for destroying uh, the state of Israel, should not be allowed to participate in that election. Now, substantively, I do not agree with Hamas on anything. I mean, I'm not, I'm not an apologist. But, but I remember t telling someone, oh, yeah, we should definitely exclude Hamas because then nobody in the Palestinian Authority will want to, uh, you know, destroy the state of Israel. And there'll be no terrorists because for Hamas, before Hamas, none of this existed. And of course, that's nonsense, right? But the, the reason I, I say that, and I don't know if this is relevant at all, but maybe it is. The reason I say that is because democracy gives voice to people whose ideas we really don't like, you know? I mean, as long as there are people that want to destroy the state of Israel, and I say this as somebody with family in the state of Israel, they should be able to vote for somebody, right? The state of Israel is no more secure if those people are excluded from, you know, from, from the political process and the Palestinian Authority. So, so I would just think of that as, as, as a criteria that we have to, you know, I, I, I talk about this in the book too. Um, there's a lot of US funding for civil society organizations that are community organizations that try to advocate for various issues. And I think these are generally, these can be good programs. So for example, there might be a group that is funded by a USAID you know, subgrant to somebody that says, we're going to work on building support and building a community organization that stops the polluting in the river. 
because it's bad for the environment in our county or our part of the country. They're pretty straightforward, right? However, if you go back and read your, you know, your Madison and all of that, pluralism, you have to have all sides represented. And my view is until the U USAID says, we're also going to give money to the organization that supports polluting the river because it's cheaper, we're not really, you know, we're, we're letting a policy agenda become bigger than the, than the democracy agenda. Sometimes we have to do that, but we have to at least recognize that. Your question about, about Cuba, or about this, this not always being aware of what's most needed on the ground, I would, two things that, that I've talked about in the book that might help answer that question. One is that as, I mean, the, the ambassador said the toolbox is broken, and, and um, you know, I, I think that could be, you know, we could have a discussion about that, but there's also not that many tools in the toolbox, right? I mean, my friend Shota has a barbecue tool set with, you know, 40 barbecue tools. This isn't that. This is like a spatula and some charcoal and stuff like that. That's about it. So there's not that many tools, right? So we, we, we try to approach and solve the problem with, with the same handful of tools. The other thing that, that's relevant to that is that there is a kind of bureaucratic logic that drives democracy promotion, right? So if you are, and, and I've seen this in many countries where I've said, why are we doing this? And the answer is because the DNG person from USAID, the head of this democracy promotion program, they always do that. That's not really an answer, or it's not a good answer. And, and so, so that's also what's, what's often driving it. I can take a couple of others right down here. Let's just be patient because we've got a bunch. Um, I'll come right here, then you two, and then I'll, I'll, work, I'll get back to you. Yeah, right here in the front. Yeah, there's a microphone here. Under that. Thank you very much. Um, fascinating um, book and, and, um, and theme. And um, I'm Frank Omar with the Hungarian Embassy, a political officer. And um, um, I just want to make it clear I'm a big believer in transatlantic relations and democracy promotion. I did that for five years uh, at an NGO in Budapest. But um, so I think the central paradox is that the modern liberal mind uh, believes so much in diversity, and yet you seem so bent on enforcing some sort of uni uniformity abroad. Um, that's, I just see that as a, a sort of a big paradox. Um, and I think maybe you should step back from the democracy promotion label, and maybe just uh, actually you talked about that governance, better governance, and especially the transition experience. Um, countries who have uh, transitioned to democracy, uh, I, I don't see why you don't rely more on your Central and Eastern European uh, allies and, and their democracy promotion organizations, um, and, and maybe do something to empower them a little more because they could be more credible in, in some tough countries. Thank you. Let's take a couple of those. This gentleman right behind here. Yeah. Hi, thank you. Um, Ilya Lazovsky from Democracy Lab at Foreign Policy. Um, one of the one of the uh, paradoxes you describe is the disconnect between the foreign policy establishment here and the American people. And I would maybe put to you a broader version of that paradox. How can we promote democracy in a world where maybe we don't believe in it anymore as much as we used to? And this is clear from you know populist movements, various right-wing movements in Europe. This is clear from what's happening with our election here. And it seems like, you know, this question of does democracy deliver is starting to become more in question. So uh, Tom Crothers wrote a pe really great piece for us about how demo maybe democracy promotion organizations should be working, even U.S. organizations should be working w to improve U.S. democracy as a way of adding credibility and so on. There are many other arguments, but can you maybe engage with this problem a bit? Because it seems kind of central and might be getting worse. Let me take one more, although I notice you don't, you do have a pen, you can jot these down, but usually as an author myself, I know the question goes on, questions usually get harder, so you take more of them and then you just answer the easy ones, so you can try to. I want to answer uh, all the questions, uh, but I want to, so I may yeah. have to use me to remind me let what me, you asked. Let me take these two here and then we'll give you some choice. Thank, Thank you. you. Yeah. Uh, George Chedishvili, uh, visiting, uh, George Chedishvili, George, uh, visiting scholar in Georgetown University. Actually, my first question was pretty similar to a uh, uh, continuation about the uh, role of your soft power as a strong uh, factor of democracy promotion, arguably one of the uh, reasons of the Cold War victory, if you, we accept this framework, was thanks to the uh, appeal, the US appeal actually to the, uh, to the foreign state. Sometimes it didn't even require promotion policy per se, because the other countries like, wanted like, to emulate the way of moving in that direction, even though kind of the, the move was not, not that efficient. Um, can so, you do you think that okay. stated as a question? Okay. Uh, so, do you think this is current problem that the U.S. experiences that the 
can we put it as democracy erosion and will it lessen the appeal of the United States like for the other countries and what will it create more resentment? Okay, but since it's question is like sequel, can I just ask you very, very short other one? Okay, okay but so, not all answered over lunch, so you'll yeah, get your okay, yeah. So um do you think that the color current drop in oil prices, if it is extended, will make the countries which the petro states, which seemed efficient, less efficient, and will create window of opportunity for the United States. Thank you. Wow. For all democracy. You slipped in a small one there. Yeah, and then <laughs> sir, right next to you. Um, yeah. Thank you. Uh, Georgi Helashvili from Georgian Embassy. Uh, I have not read the book yet, but uh, it seems the premise, your premise is that, the dem that democratic promotion is not quite working. Broadly. Uh, so, but it seems that you are measuring results in accordance with ambitious goals. But how about measuring success worldwide in, uh, in U.S. efforts in accordance to the resources committed by the U.S. government? And also related, what's a correlation, a uh, historic correlation, between American government's efforts, efforts and uh, democratic breakthroughs, case by case? Thank you. Okay, yeah, take, take, simple question. Yeah, take okay. a couple of those, yeah. So I'm going, to try, I'm going to answer all of them, but I'm going to try to remember yours. If I don't answer, interrupt me and say, hey, you didn't answer. Um, you're right, there is this, there is this paradox, right, where, and, and we see this play out in our domestic politics as well, where tolerance, right, you know, these good liberal values that lead to, you know, we want to support democracy, then we are not, we also, there is this, we're not going to buy this cultural relativism argument that, you know, some countries, this is just our way of doing it, right? And, and that's a paradox. And my view is if you support democracy promotion, you can't take those, article, those arguments seriously. For example, it is if you go out there to America, right, and talk even to educated people about Russia, what they will tell you is Russia has always had and always needs a strongman leader. I don't quite know what that means, right? I mean, I, I, I'm, I find that offensive. I'm not, if I were Russian, I would find that offensive. Um, the Chinese, they can't really have democracy because there's so many of them. What, what, what does that mean? <laughs> that sounds to me like racism, right? Um, you know, it used to be in this country that if you weren't from a northern and western country uh, of origin in Europe, northwestern European country, and weren't Protestant, you weren't ready for democracy because you couldn't be a small-d Democrat if you were Catholic because of a miracle happens, the Pope, right? That was known as prejudice. Right? So, so I think we have to really, yeah, if you believe in democracy, you believe in democracy. And if you don't, you should get out of the democracy promotion business. So, so the, the second part of your question is, you know, the United States, I think, does a lot of good work in bringing, you know, the, the experience of other countries to bear. So it's third country. So, for example, there are, you know, I think a lot of people who don't pay a lot of attention to democracy promotion think of a typical study tour of 20 members of the Parliament of Moldova going to Washington, right? But very frequently, 20 members of the parliament, excuse me, the parliament of Moldova might go to Riga, right? A more similar experience, not to mention closer. Similar, they will generally will have, be able to speak in the language, the common language if possible. So there is, you know, we, we see very good people working for US funded organizations all over the world who are not Americans. So could we do more of that? Absolutely, but we do a fair amount. So, so your question about the U.S., right? I'm trying to keep this in order. Your question about the United States, right? Yeah. What was your name? Ilya. Ilya. Um, I talk about this in the book. This is a real, to me, this is a, you know, the, not only is our democracy fraying, right, in many respects. I'm not sure more or less than that, but it always has been, right? I mean, it's worth noting that um, we have had universal suffrage in the United States for just over 50 years, right? That, that we had apartheid in a third of our country for, you know, up until about 50 years ago, you know. And, and that is, we can say we've come a long way because we have an African-American president or this and that, but those are central facts about the United States that we, away from which we, we cannot really move. Um, but, but if we move to, to the more immediate present, so we have examples, and I talk about them in the book. For example, Bush Gore in 2000, right? this strange election that played out where there's a lot of people outside the U.S. really kind of thought was fraudulent and weird and it looked and had this whole kind of, you know, the brother of the guy, you know, all of that, all of that kind of thing. But in addition, we live in a technological environment where the, because we, 
we, we do set ourselves, we, we, this is not a police state, you know, this is not a dictatorship. So that when a problem occurs, when an African American person is shot by a police officer for doing something, I don't know, like maybe being African American, um, the world finds out in, in, in a matter of hours, right? When, when a clownish person runs for office in the United States, it is a much bigger deal than when it happens in another country, right? And the world finds out much faster. We have to be aware of this. This does make our work much more, considerably more difficult. On the other hand, when we get it right, right? When, when, I mean, when Barack Obama was elected in 2008, and I know that there are people in this room who didn't support Barack Obama when he ran for office in 2008. You know, some of you, I assume, supported a John McCain. But it was still was a feel-good story about the United States that, at least in the short run, was, was very good for us. Um, so to your question about you had soft power and oil prices, right, deeply related. Um, what I'll say about, about soft power is that in this technology age, soft power cuts two ways because people can see everything. But also, other countries have soft power too. And it's often easy to understate that, right? So in the part of the world that, that the CGI, on which CGI focuses a lot of attention, Russia has enormous soft power. And to not recognize that is to live kind of in a fantasy world, right? The Russian language is very important. Um, Russian and Russian uh, framing of issues still is powerful in much of the former Soviet world. And there are other countries also that have soft power, especially the kind of soft power that is not just you know, NGOs and educational exchanges, but is music, culture, film, television, all of that stuff. Um, so, so there's a lot of countries with, with soft power in, in, throughout the world. Um, oil prices, I'm, I'm uh, I, yes, a decline in oil prices, you know, I, I mean, if you're sitting in the Kremlin right now, you're not hoping that oil prices are gonna go down, right? And if you're sitting, and if you're ISIS, uh, my dog is named ISIS, by the way. Um, if, if you're ISIS, you're not hoping that oil prices are going down, or all these other kind of, but in my view, I, I, I'm going to maybe contradict something I said a little bit earlier. While democracy and governance don't have to be linked together, the extent to which non-democratic countries are effective at governance is often overstated. That's a story that gets told. Um, an example, one example I would give of this is, we haven't talked about this country much, is China, right? Ch the, the notion that China is a well-governed country with no discontent is a triumph of media repression over reality. Um, Jorgi, your question was, here's the jet lag kicking in. Your question was about, right. Um, Mary, I, I don't think that the takeaway from this book is that democracy promotion is failing. I think the takeaway from this book is that democracy is much more complicated than we usually view. Uh, and I am, you know, I used to teach a course on democracy assistance at Columbia. And on my last day of the course, the last you know, time the course would meet every semester, I would, because one thing we didn't talk about here was the role of the military and all of this, but, but I do talk about it in the book. And I said, and it is clear that we can never promote democracy through military means, and the students would you know, write that down, and I would say, and that is why Germany and Japan are still fascist countries, and they would get about halfway through writing down that sentence, wait, what? Um, and, and we have had successes, major successes, um, and, and even moving into the more recent past, you know, the new members, many of the, even though we talk about backsliding, but still many newer democracies in, in recent years. The, and so, so, so I, I'm not that, I'm not that bearish on it, at least from a historical perspective. Um, my concern about thinking from like a bang for the buck approach is that a bang for the buck approach is a good way of looking at modest, modest programs for modest goals. But if your goal is to make a country slightly less repressive, right, or to make one, or to breed life into a few NGOs, in my view, those are honorable goals. But it's not the same as saying your goal is to make democracy, or to, I don't say make, facilitate, nurture, encourage democracy. That's a different thing. Um, it's 10 to 1, and the organizers have asked me to, to stop here. I know some of you have been patient. Uh, Lincoln uh, managed to run out the clock there in the answers I'm happy to the to last one. Um, but I'm afraid we need to stop. Lincoln, I was saying to Lincoln <clears throat> before the event, you know, I, there's a lot of practitioners like Lincoln who are out there 
on the ground doing a lot of work on programs, and many of them have the aspiration to write. A lot. Actually, there are a lot of books burning inside practitioners out there. Few of them ever actually get out and take form. And Lincoln's, this is his third such book, and so I salute you for, I'm, I'm being completely serious, taking the time to engage in the critical reflection, the simple hard work of writing a book, and putting yourself forward in this way is no small thing. We need more books on this topic. We need more critical reflection. In that spirit, I'd like to congratulate you on this, this accomplishment. Thank lunch you. is out there. Hold on, hold on. Lunch is out there. Let's not call this Lincoln's last lunch. Uh, <laughs> let's continue this conversation. The book is available for sale. I think about $22 credit or cash, I suspect. And the author's right here. You could get him to sign it. Increases the value immediately. And uh, so, Lincoln, thanks very much. And Thank you. Best of luck with Thank this. You. Good luck. <laughs>